Welcome. We're here today to talk about the Gorst planning effort that began in 2012. With me is City of Bremerton Senior Planner Allison Satter. Allison has worked on this project throughout. This video is for the benefit of agencies that can be watched by all so some can be familiar with how the City of Bremerton developed a plan for the future development of Gorst. Allison, welcome. So let's get started. What have you been working on this year? Oh man, this year has been a pretty entertaining one. It's been about the last 15 months and what the city of Bremerton got lucky enough to get a environmental protection agency grant in which we can go and look at the Gorst watershed planning effort. Uh, we partnered with the Kitsap County, as right now this is actually Kitsap County jurisdiction, um, with the potential for the City of Bremerton to annex the urban growth area. However, within the Gorst watershed, there is some of the City of Bremerton area, such as the forested lands with our watershed, um, and some great benefits. Uh, with Gorst right now, we just put in sewers, so it was prime for redevelopment, and with the recession coming out, you know, this is going to happen, Gorst is going to get redeveloped, and since we haven't really looked in at Gorst, Let's make a, a smart planning effort to how are we going to develop course in the next 20 years. So this was a great opportunity with the EPA grant and to look in it and to partner with Kitsap County and, and to work on a great um, plan for Gorst and the kind of policies that we went you know and got familiar with was one we wanted to make Gorst a community we wanted people to be proud of it which is not necessarily the case right now mm -hmm. um, we also wanted to protect the water quality there's a lot of great benefits for those of you who don't know about Gorst um, there's estuaries there's forested lands we have the Gorst Creek watershed or Gorst Creek um, that has actually endangered steelhead salmon, um, which is now classified as an endangered species habitat. There's the Jarstead Rearing Facility, where the Suquamish tribe um, does go and raise salmon to be released. And um, this just area is, is prime for um, environmental protection and also the redevelopment. So we want to go out this on a, on a smart level, and this was a great opportunity with this EPA grant. Excellent. So what's so unique about the process? Well, this is great. With the grant that we received from EPA was kind of um, to go and illustrate the watershed planning effort, to go and look at the environment as a whole and then plan for the, the smaller components. So usually with a plan, we plan for the urban environment and then what gets affected by the urban environment. Luckily now, um, with this EPA grant, it was a great opportunity to look at what's happening in the watershed. We have this great environmental component. Let's look in the big picture. Let's identify what needs to be protected and what needs to be developed. Let's start in the bigger picture and work to the smaller picture. And so it was really great because we created a watershed characterization framework plan, a sub area plan, and a planned action ordinance, which all was tied into this grant. So it was a great opportunity. Excellent. So the watershed characterization, how was that done and what results were applied to the rest of the process? Oh, the watershed characterization, that was the volume one of our three volume plan. And the watershed characterization and framework plan, what we did was we looked at the watershed as a whole. We identified the watershed area and luckily enough, the Department of um, Fish and Wildlife and Department of um, Environmental Protection Agency has an analytical framework which goes and provides you these resources to be able to identify what's called assessment units. And what the assessment units uh, do is you get a, a piece of area such as your watershed, you divide it into areas that make sense due to the topography, due to the um, what's there on site, maybe streams make areas a little bit you know more specific. And from those areas of the assessment unit, you figure out what is it rate for the flow, um, you know, the water resources that it provides for the watershed. If it's got high potential to give a lot of resources to protect the, uh, the watershed, that gets, gets a higher rating than, let's say, an area that's paved paradise. Mm -hmm. So we have these different assessment values um, that we look at and kind of determine, okay, what needs to be where and why. And so we did, and uh, we, went, we created these assessment units. We had Fish and Wildlife buy off on it, and we talked to a lot of different agencies because this is something you can't just go in the city and go, we have all the expertise, let's figure this out. We did go to many different agencies. We had comment period um, to, to have them agree to see if our assessment units were actually accurate. Um, once we have these assessment units, it was 
the result was um, to ask the two fundamental questions. One, where in the watershed should the management be focused? Where should we develop? Where should we protect? And now that we have those two ideals, where sh or what types of actions would be most appropriate in that area, such as restoration, protection, conservation, or development? Um, we also gave criteria to historical preservation. So if there's you know, an existing site or something that we even know, such as we're going to rate this land at a high value, but we know actually it's received land use approval to be you know, treed or to clear cut, that would get a different rating because of what we know and you know, what's happening in this um, environment. Um, yeah, we have the slide to go and include for the, uh, the watershed outline. And the area in green um, you will see is the area that should be protected. This is actually the forested land. Um, the area that's yellow, um, that is the Skia, South Kitsap Industrial Area, and also the Gorst Area. And so the Gorst Area and the Skia, these are actually urban environments already developed so it was great to have this watershed characterization plan that said, yes, upland, forested lands protect, and as you see, the darker green become lighter green. Those are protecting a little less. And then the yellow is, no, let's make all the development within the watershed happen here. And with the, the framework plan, it also provided guidelines and saying, this is why we should protect the uplands, um, because we do have stormwater issues downlands, and the uplands are very important to, to protect the, the lowlands below. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the watershed characterization, it was, uh, um, it was a great resource and it provided a high level guidance um, which was used with the City of Bremerton and Kidsap County um, to develop the watershed framework policies and goals. Uh, while at the same time, you know, we allow for development, we're also trying to protect the environment and so that's the whole push with this project. Allison, that's a lot of information. Where can folks go? to actually look at everything you just talked about. Oh, that's great, Shar, because yeah, I am doing the, uh, this at a very quick 10,000 level and the assessment units for the rating plans, that is uh, much more detail than I'll get into on this video, but everyone can go find out uh, more information because we did make a great effort within www.gorstwatershed.com. We actually have technical memorandums for each one of our processes that talk about how do we do it? A step-by-step -step process. And of course, anyone can always touch base with the city of Bremerton. Get in touch with me and I'll tell you how we worked through the process. Um, but yeah, www.gorstwatershed.com. I'll say that a couple times probably throughout this to get it through uh, everyone's mind. So Allison, we have this characters, a watershed characterization. What's next? Well, to summarize, there's a lot of information with the watershed characterization. The first step, again, just to summarize, is you identify the project's purpose. The purpose was to protect and also to allow for development. Then now we choose appropriate scale. We choose the watershed. Let's focus on that. You evaluated the model results. The assessment units got buy-off on that, um, that they seemed appropriate. And then we identified the predominant land uses in the focus areas. Um, so again, Gorst UGA and the South Kitsap Industrial Area, that's where development needs to go. And then what's next? A very robust public input time. And, you know, we go out and we try to make zoning regulations and development standards, which is a sub area plan. And the sub area plan is what most people, like you, would probably utilize if you bought a piece of property in Gorst. Mm -hmm. You would be using that sub area plan. So that's the next big process. Mm -hmm. What's a sub area plan? <laughs> Good that you asked on that prep on the last one. Um, the purpose of a sub area plan is to provide greater detail. So with GORS, since we had the watershed, we had no areas we needed protected, we had goals and policies in the watershed characterization. Now what's appropriate is to have the sub area plan that specifically identifies the urban growth area, which in Gorst is 335 acres. And we looked at that smaller piece of land within the whole watershed and said, how should this be developed in the next 20 years? Um, as I mentioned before, we just installed sewers back in 2008 and 2009 with the city of Bremerton um, to all the commercial properties. So this is the first time they have been hooked up to the sewer line and the, the septic systems actually have prohibited them from developing at a greater rate. So oh. once this you know, recession starts picking up, 
Gorse is going to be the next area to look at. And even including the mine area up on the slope, that area is going, it's, um, going to be reclaimed within the next 10 years. So it's not going to be a mining site anymore. What's the next plan? And if we have to plan for 20 years out, I'm going to tell you that mining resource doesn't necessarily want to be mining anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we did is we went out to the public. We went out to um, agencies, to our, our project partners, um, which included, you know, for the agencies, Department of Health, the tribes, um, local governments, transportation, uh, many different agencies. And we said, here's three different alternatives. We have the one, if we do absolutely nothing, you don't want us to go forward with this, you think it's perfect, um, which is what the current zoning is, which is what um, Kitsap County has right now. The second option was to keep Gorst as a commercial corridor, so just have it all commercial. And the, second, or the third alternative we looked at was try to create a, com a complete community. So we would have residential and commercial components within the Gorst area. We didn't know which one was going to necessarily people are going to want to believe in or you know support and we did we went to a couple open houses and it was great and even all the agencies uh, including the tribe supported the commercial or not the commercial quarter the complete community and it was great to hear the environment um, component that everyone brought up even the residents and for those of you who don't think there's a community in Gorse there is it was um, outstanding to have them come and say no we know how important our shoreline is we know how important the gorse creek watershed is uh, or even the gorse creek with the salmon we love it let's protect it uh, let's push for that and even the dealerships down there the the businesses they knew that they were dealing with stormwater issues and um, planning so the the sub area plan is what most people deal with it's what the citizens deal with and as this is right now Kitsap county jurisdiction but city of bremerton has a potential to annex it we wanted to create a plan that didn't have any hiccups in the road. So it was going to be a plan, and it is a plan that we actually both adopted, the Kitsap County and City of Bremerton. And it, the idea is right now as you're in Kitsap County, great, go and continue with this plan. The minute you annex into the City of Bremerton, we don't want to make it difficult, more difficult for the owners. So have the exact same plan. So if you look at our Gore, our Gore sub area plan, chapter eight is actually the city of Bremerton guidelines, design standards, setbacks, what uses are allowed, and chapter nine is the county. So it's the same exact code. We have different chapters because our formatting is different, but they pretty much get to the same point and design standards mesh up with us. Um, we're the same. So we're trying to make it easier for when that annexation does happen, the property owners really don't see a difference. Mm -hmm. um, so, and of course, as I mentioned before, the sub area plan, you can see it in its entirety um, at www.gorstwatershed.com. Um, and the sub area plans is a process that many people go through. So there's a lot of information. So I'll try to keep it as a, uh, you know, a quicker analysis as more people have done this. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So you mentioned three documents in the beginning. Which one have we not talked about? Oh, I think this is by far the most interesting one, uh, which is a planned action. Not many jurisdictions or cities have used a planned action approach yet, and, um, but it's actually a great opportunity for cities and counties to use this um, resource. A planned action is what it is, is an ability to streamline environmental review by the city or the jurisdiction doing the environmental review up front. So if you were a developer today, you would have to go in and apply for a permit. You would have to, if you were doing um, a building that required environmental review, it would be a six week process, an additional $320. And at that point, we'd go and send it out to comments and people could come back and say, Shar, I think you should add an extra rain garden or you should have extra mitigation measures um, because of your project. What a plan action does is we go and we do all the work up front and we say, okay, if you fall under these thresholds, if you build a building that's not bigger than X square feet or that doesn't cover as much impervious surfaces, we've already done the environmental review for us. We know if you do this, you will have to do X, Y, and Z mitigation. And like I said, Gorse has a lot of storm water. So the mitigations have to do um, a lot with stormwater, but there's additional mitigations that are required. So if you were going to go build something, you come in, if you wanted to use the planned action ordinance, we would say, great, and go and apply with this additional list. We will go through the standards and see um, if you apply. And the way that you would have to apply is one, 
or for anyone actually who wants to adopt a planned action ordinance. Uh, the planned action ordinance has to comply with the SEPA rules, which is the State Environmental uh, Policy Agency. So it does have to follow their rules and guidelines because you can't just say we're not going to have any environmental review. Um, the studies of the environmental impact statement that we did do have to be associated with a plan. So when we did the sub-area plan, we did an environmental review um, with it that's called an environmental impact statement. And the environmental impact statement, um, it reviewed our three preferred alternatives within our sub-area plan and it says if you go with one, two, or three, here's the mitigations that are required because you're going to be doing this much impervious surfaces. We know this. This is what you should do to mitigate. And so we use that. And so I recommend to any agency that's planning on using a planned action ordinance, know from the beginning that you're going to go through this process because it's going to be much more difficult to go after and decide, well, it would be good to do this. You're looking at a much more stringent environmental review because this is what you're doing up front. You're doing everyone's review. Um, and then it identifies uh, the type and amount of development. So in our planned action ordinance, we talk about, you know, how many housing units would this comply? If you are going, if we say 30 and you're doing 31, you have to do your own environmental review. If you do with the square footage of a building, if you go one foot above, you're doing your own environmental review, which we have a process for and most people are used to it. Um, but this is kind of nice because the developer now can go and apply and go, I know exactly what I have to do. I know this is going to cost me X amount of dollars. I know this. I'm comfortable with it. There's no surprises. So it's kind of nice for the developer. Um, and what this means for uh, future pro projects is, yeah, they don't have to do that extra six weeks. So everyone, time's money. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's nice to kind of um, to reduce this. So it helps uh, facilitate private and public infrastructure. Yeah, very good. How do you create a planned action area? Oh, I'll try to make this simple and down to three steps. And like I mentioned before, though, we do have the tech memo on the gorstwatershed.com. Check it out and you can read it in detail. Um, but I'll just limit this down to three steps. So one, you need to develop a plan and a, uh, prepare a plan action EIS. So developing the plan, like I said before, we did it with our sub area plan and we attach the EIS to that. Um, you can do it many different ways. It doesn't have to be a sub-area plan, but you do have to have some form of a plan. You can look at the, the um, RCWs and it'll help guide you on what plans you can attach this to. Um, and then to get to the um, environmental you know, um, decision, you have to have buy-off from different agencies too. So throughout the environmental uh, impact statement released through its comment period. We released a, released different drafts of this um, planned action ordinance saying, we're still thinking about doing this, heads up. Um, because right now there's still a lot of um, questions on how, you know, is this appropriate? How can we do environmental review all up in the front? You can do it smartly. Um, they still have to comply with our critical areas ordinance. They still have to comply with our shoreline master program. Um, they have to comply with uh, the FEMA rules, as we know, they're fl affected by flooding there. They still have to comply um, with all the state regulations. But as much as we can tie into here, that would be great because, again, it helps them know what they're working with in this mitigation measures that we do come up with. Um, so in the environmental impact statement, we address that. We know that FEMA was an issue. We knew that uh, the endangered species habitat was going to be an issue. So we created mitigations to try to address that. Uh, when step two, uh, now that we have the plan, we had a feedback, buy off on it. Step two was finalizing and adopting uh, the planned action ordinance, which sounds easy peasy, uh, but you're going to planning commissions, you know, and you're getting a buy off from them, um, and you're going to city council. The, the same way that any jurisdiction would adopt an ordinance, you go through that process, mm -hmm. um, which does have public testimony, does have, uh, you know, an opportunity for people to comment. Um, and uh, the additional, one additional thing that you have to do for the planned action ordinance is have a community meeting. And there is an RCW on that, so I'd recommend everyone check that out. Uh, the community meeting is a little fluffy in its language because it says it's a community meeting, but you have to invite agencies. So we invited agencies and the community, even though it doesn't say you have to invite a commu the community. Ah, it's a little confusing because it says it's a community meeting. We just wanted to make sure we covered all our bases and invited everyone to attend. And um, we had the draft ordinance. Um, we talked about it. We exposed you know, the different agencies to it. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, a great opportunity to get it adopted. And we did finally get it adopted in February 2013. So you can do it all with your plan. If you're going to adopt your sub-area plan, you can have your plan action ordinance adopted at the same time. 
but we pushed it off because we wanted to make sure we had a great product, uh, product and so we took that two extra months to finalize it and uh, make it perfect. We do have an example of one that we've already used um, within the South Kitsap industrial area. So Bremerton actually has two plant action areas, um, which was um, nice to be able to utilize something that we've already experienced. Once you get it adopted though, now we get to implement the plant action ordinance. And for each development that comes to the, the city, you'll be looking at a couple different questions to see if it, if it meets. Uh, the first one, is it within the plant action area? And um, the zoning map, um, it's the zoning map that we have is the whole Gorst urban growth area. So that is at 335 acres. Now this is kind of a good opportunity for jurisdictions to decide, is it appropriate to have all 335 acres covered on the planned action ordinance? Maybe. Um, we played around with the idea of maybe not having the shoreline in the planned action ordinance area and saying if you're on the shoreline to develop, you need to go through an additional review because we don't know if we can encapsulate everything you may have to do within this one process. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we did a robust uh, environmental impact statement that had great mitigations and requirements for the, uh, the shoreline. So we felt comfortable being addressed. But with you as a jurisdiction or as you know, an agency, you can limit the area, you can take out one neighborhood if you want to. However, just have it illustrated. Um, the second thing that the developer, you know, when they apply that we would look at, uh, is the development project within the scope of the planned action ordinance? Uh, that was what I was talking about before. If you're not the threshold, if you're not the housing units, if it's um, you know, something just not covered, you still have to go through the same process that you would have to go through before with the environmental review process for SEPA. Um, are there any environmental impacts within the scope um, that are beyond uh, the planned action EIS? And yeah, if they go and an example is, let's say your uh, planned action ordinance says you can build within five feet of a wetland. That's your mitigation, but you have to provide something over yonder. If you're now going beyond and taking away the whole wetland, that's your proposals that you're going beyond it, no, you're out of the threshold. You have to go through an additional environmental review. You don't get to use our planned action process. And then does it include mitigation measures or conditions outlined in the planned action ordinance? If they give you a plan and show you, hey, I'm using your planned action ordinance. Here's all the mitigations. I comply. I'm great. Go forward. Whatever process they're in, land use, keep going. If they're in building permit, keep going. Um, no, if they didn't meet the mitigations, if there's no mitigations on the plans, Sorry, additional environmental review is required, six week process, or you need to change your plans and have those mitigations in because there's no way we can help you if you don't meet the planned action ordinance. Uh, one thing to note is, as I mentioned before, this is not in, uh, uh, right now the uh, Gorst area is located in Kidsap County jurisdiction. So this planned action ordinance, even though we have it in place, is not actually able to be utilized until the point of when the city of Bremerton annexes this area. Once we annex the area, then the plan action ordinance is immediately in effect and uh, we would go forward with that process. And the county is uh, considering a plan action ordinance and so stay tuned to see what happens uh, if they go forward with that. So did the public buy off on this? Oh, there was so much public buy off. It was incredible. It was, of course, you have um, the people who, who have um, concerns, but we had, I think it was 26 meetings over the course of 14 months. Um, as this is county and city uh, jurisdiction, city went to a meeting the same day that the county. So if you couldn't attend the city area, you get to go to the county. We had um, three open houses within the Gorst area. Since this is a Gorst project, we wanted to make sure they were um, available to attend. And there was 30 or 40 people each meeting. So it was a well-attended meetings. Um, People weren't surprised by this when it came forward. Um, we had stakeholder meetings where we went to the, um, the people who owned you know, the businesses down in Gorst. We stopped by, met them, exposed them to this so they knew what was coming ahead. And so there were really no surprises. So uh, at the point that we came for adoption, there was no real animosity and it did get approved um, unanimously through council and the, uh, the board of county commissioners. So yeah, there was definitely some buy off. Excellent. Um, Allison, let's wrap up with again, where can people see all this document, all these documents, and how do they reach you? Let's, let's finish that. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, again, www.gorstwatershed.com. Recommend it to any agency that you feel wants to get exposed to either the watershed planning, uh, sub area planning, or the planned action ordinance. Uh, there's the tech memos that we hopefully will be able to help support 
um, you to go forward with you know understanding this and our different agencies that are going to be utilizing this understanding where we're coming from as a city or jurisdiction if anyone wants to feel free to get in touch with me uh, you can contact me at my phone number 360-473-5845 with the city of Bremerton uh, my name is Allison Satter again with the city of Bremerton so Google me find me ask me questions I would love to help participate in any way for any agency to go forward or just have questions on this